Hi, welcome to our final event of the fifth Politico Healthcare Summit. And I couldn't be more excited with her, about our guest, but first, let me urge you to go to the slide card app and sign up so that you can ask questions. Um, so you can go to that. Uh, the information about slide card is on the uh, page for this event where you are watching it. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Amir Cook, the new, brand new, just started on Monday, chief of the European Medicines Agency. And she's not getting any honeymoon or ease in period, um, even with this session, we have some breaking news that came out just in the past half hour or so. Um, Pfizer and BioNTech have put out their uh, uh, press release about their phase three data. They say their trial is complete. They say their vaccine is 95% effective and that is safe. And that they will be applying for a conditional marketing authorization within the coming days with the European Medicines Agency. So, <laughs> Emer, <laughs> what, what can we expect going forward? When am I going to be able to put this shot in my arm? Okay, well, uh, this is all very, very encouraging. Um, Really, when we set up this interview, I was uh, I was expecting to uh, have to prevaricate a lot more. But now uh, we've had very promising results now uh, or outcomes from uh, two companies. Uh, this news that Pfizer is going to put in their application for the, the conditional marketing authorization is very, very welcomed. We're all ready. Um, we're waiting. And we're, we're anxious to um, make sure that we make this process as efficient and effective as possible. Um, I have to stress, we haven't seen, we've only, we've seen some preliminary data. Um, we've seen the interim results, but we haven't seen uh, the final results that they've just uh, announced within the last half hour. Um, what we what we hear from the the company is that the results are very promising both from an efficacy and safety perspective we will now evaluate that information and really make sure that uh, we apply the scientific rigor to to um, make sure that any vaccine that we do authorize uh, is safe of high quality and effective so it meets the needs of the european uh, population is there anything you can say about timing, about when the recommendation um, for authorization might, might come through? Well, in anticipation of, um, uh, of, of the application, we've been looking at our procedures and what we can do to um, speed up the administrative processes. So we're very hopeful that we'll be able to have an opinion before the end of, end of the year. Great. That's great news. Um, that said, I mean, does it, we're in this unusual situation where companies are releasing this preliminary data. There's been a lot of talk over the past six months about science by press release and regular people are arguably paying more attention to this preliminary data than they would under normal circumstances. What, um, what type of pressure does this put on you as, as a regulator? Does it make it harder to make a thoughtful decision? Well, it, it means that we're very visible and it means that we have to really make sure that we stand over the scientific principles because that's our job. Our job is to serve the public. Our job is not to serve the media. Um, so oh, come on, that's... come on. <laughs> I'm sorry, continue. <laughs> Um, but you know, uh, you know, the reason we're here as a, as a as a scientific community is because we have the expertise to do this evaluation, um, and um, it, it's uh, it has to be done because um, we have to look at uh, really this is this is it's a it's a great opportunity. Um, everything. Uh, sounds great, but really the devil is in the detail, and we have to make sure that uh, what is being said is actually what is presented and what uh, our scientists agree um, can be given to the European population. And another thing that has been very interesting is it's um, this race for a vaccine and for treatments has allowed us to do transatlantic comparisons in a way, uh, in a very direct way. And 
an interesting thing emerged in, in, uh, over the summer and in the early fall where the U.S. Food and Drug Administration was putting an out announcement saying, look, you know, we are looking for a vaccine that's at least 50% effective. The, the WHO, where, where you also um, just until uh, last week worked, as I think you also put out kind of guidance saying that you wanted to see around 50% with a 30% lower bound in the range. Um, the U.S. FDA also said that they wanted to see, I think, at least two, um, a certain minimum number of people in the control group who actually had coronavirus. They wanted to see a certain set amount of safety or yeah of kind of post uh, injection safety data and whenever we would ask the AMA if if there were similar rules that they were working with the answer was always no where we're operating more on a case-by-case -case basis can you help us understand these different approaches well, I'm not sure that there's really such different approaches because we're all talking about a stringent regulatory approach and uh, making sure that any vaccine will will meet robust scientific standards. It's I think the question is how explicit we are about that, and that's where we have we have differed. Uh, normally, we wouldn't be so explicit, but I think the the message that we've been giving very clearly to all vaccine developers is that we expect a very robust uh, set of scientific data. Now, we are coming out with a reflection paper where we do talk about 50% uh, efficacy and a lower bound of 30% with a possibility of going below that. But just remember, these are estimates. We're, 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 we're debating estimates at the moment. What we need to do is look at the data and look at uh, and actually, I'm, I'm, you know, the fact that uh, the, 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 the data looks so good at the moment actually makes this whole debate about what we've said or haven't said almost irrelevant at this point. So I would say um, the messages are the same. Uh, what isn't the same is the specificity or the granu granularity about specific numbers. But we expect similar levels of efficacy and we expect at least six weeks follow up on safety. Uh, for example, but we'll be coming out with a reflection paper either today or tomorrow that will outline uh, our thinking um, uh, on this in response to some of these um, uh, uh, arguments that have come up on both sides. Well, that's great. We will definitely keep our eye out um, for that reflection paper. And uh, another of my reflections on the transatlantic situation, um, during the presidential election in the United States, the FDA became very politicized. And you have a lot of um, people in the United States saying that uh, even politicians, especially Democratic politicians, saying that they won't trust a vaccine or they'll trust the vaccine if if Fauci says they could take it. Anthony Fauci is not actually the regulator in the, in the U.S. You have individual U.S. states saying that they want to do their own um, regulatory process. And that just makes me wonder if, if people even outside of Europe um, in, in other countries such as the U.S. with highly developed regulatory systems are also going to be looking more at the EMA's decision than they normally would to kind of, you know, add trust even to what their own regulator says. And how are you, how are you bracing for that? So I, I think the, the whole question of trust in the vaccine is something that we really have to pay a lot of attention to. And it's one of the reasons why we, we want to maintain our independence and the independence of the scientific process. And we, we have a system in Europe that does maintain independence of the scientific process. Um, this, is, uh, this is our opportunity to make sure that we, we can deliver something that, uh, pe that European population can trust. Um, the value of a vaccine is only valuable if it can be, if, if the uh, outcomes of the research can be trusted. So the, the communication around this is very, very important. And it's something that we need to invest strongly in. I would say also we need to invest strongly in ensuring 
um, post-deployment safety follow-up because, again, this is um, deployment at a scale that we are not normally used to, so we have to put in additional safety uh, monitoring um, uh, provisions, and you probably saw that we came out with a safety monitoring package uh, last Friday where we're looking, looking at weekly updates uh, from any deployment of a COVID vaccine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, we're seeing a lot of misinformation already circulate around um, a lot of conspiracy theories about vaccines, and that's on top of some pretty severe vaccine hesitancy around Europe that predated the coronavirus pandemic. Um, you know, uh, your predecessor, Guido Rossi, kind of acknowledged that this was this was a little bit of new territory for the EMA. He he d- did not tweet. Um, do you plan to have a Twitter account? Are you, what's your strategy for fighting some of this misinformation? And is that the EMA's role, or or am I uh, am I making a, an assumption here that's not correct? No, it is. I mean. As you know, we are completely tr- uh, committed to transparency. We've we've already got provisions for uh, transparency of clinical trial information. Um, we we need to we can't ignore the, the fact that uh, there is a, a debate in in social media that there 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 are um, there's a huge amount of misinformation around, and I think it is our job to make sure that we. We are the source of correct information that people can rely on us and that we're accessible and uh, and reach the um, the public. Mm-hmm. A- any decision on a Twitter account for you? So appar- yes, I have a Twitter account. All right. <laughs> I uh, need maybe, to obviously uh, update my uh, my list. Sorry, no. Maybe I don't have. I'm. I have a. I will tweet. Okay. <laughs> We have it on the record. She will tweet. That's what we wanted to know. Or maybe the EMA will tweet on my behalf. Is that all right? Yes. <laughs> well, keep us I'm updated sorry. on that on that new handle. Um, okay. We'll be very curious to watch it. Um, I, I know I, I am approving tweets. That, that I know. Got it. Okay. <laughs> um, um, all right. I'm going to shift um, shift away. Um, what if you know you you started sort of um, um, expressing interest in this position long before the pandemic? Although certainly you were chosen by the board during the pandemic. Um, what you know when this is passed? You know what what do you want your other priorities during your tenure at the EMA to be? So, um, as, as, as you, you rightly said, I actually started the application process for um, this uh, position in June 2019. And I remember writing my letter of motivation, which uh, had no mention of COVID, uh, surprisingly enough. Um, but it did, um, I, I, I did talk about uh, digitalization, I did talk about antimicrobial resistance. Um, I, I, I spoke about, um, or I, I, uh, the need to support innovation, but also availability of medicines. These were um, some of the issues that I felt were really needed to be addressed from the agency perspective. And I would like to address each of those. I'm going to address first um, um, your point on R&D because we have an audience question from somebody who I know is indeed quite good at social media, Boris I- Boris Azais. He says the COVID pandemic has illustrated the need to have an EU-based R&D base. Do you see the EMA's role as a critical component of the EU's ability to support pharmaceutical innovation? And if so, how would this play out in concrete steps and activities? So I, I think we we have to be a lot more connected with the research initiatives, and that's something that we're working on with DG Research, also with the academics. We've we've uh, with the academic community, let me say, because uh, we've started. You know, we've worked a lot with uh, patient organisations and healthcare professional organisations, and our work with the academic community um, has started a little bit later. Um, but the need to have an integrated a- a- approach to research and uh, potential um, uh, products is something that we believe very strongly with, and to have an independent source 
of research that can um, uh, support many of our scientific decisions is something that uh, we would like to develop further. Mm -hmm. And on AMR, we hear a lot of talk about incentives um, and that's antimicrobial research, superbugs, um, uh, medicines that are resistant to, to the medications that we have created to fight them. Um, um, what, what can be done to deal with um, this problem from a regulatory perspective? Well, I think the sort of things we can do from a regulatory perspective is really to make sure that we have an aligned international approach so that uh, companies don't have to do different things for different jurisdictions. Um, we, that we use our um, procedures like the prime, um, uh, the priority medicines initiative to support um, applications for um, um, new antibiotics. Um, that we look very carefully at their use um, and um, at how they will be used um, and, uh, or reserved um, as, as the case may be. Um, I think uh, the whole question of incentives or what sort of incentives is something that uh, would have to be examined at a European level. It's not, it's not our mandate as such, but it is a dilemma that uh, we do as a community have to have to address. Thank you. And as far as um, as access, how you know are, when you say that word, do you think of pricing? Do you think of uh, preventing shortages? What um, what do you have in mind for that priority? So I would say there there are. There are two aspects that I would um, that I'm thinking of, um, and one was very much the question of shortages, uh, because um, uh, we were seeing uh, 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 quite a difference between availability of medicines across the EU, depending on whether you're a small or a large member state, depending on what your market was. So that is something that EMA has invested in even before COVID. In fact, uh, Brexit was um, it was one something we stepped up in the light of Brexit, Brexit in order to anticipate um, uh, um, preventing possible shortages. Um, so we have a task force that has been well, where we have been working on that with, with the member states. And I think in terms of the affordability and availability, the whole question of our interactions with health technology assessment bodies and payers is something that we need to um, we need to, to work on more because uh, it, it needs to have we, we need to have a continuum of, of approach from assessment to um, uh, HTA to uh, reimbursement, and we need to understand each other processes and uh, initiatives like the joint scientific advice that we did with uh, the health technology assessment bodies or, or have helped us to understand the respective needs and the uh, um, ways that we can we can anticipate uh, differences and possible roadblocks that do ultimately mean that patients don't have access to the medicines that we have approved. Yeah, and I want to I want to delve a bit more into the interaction with HTA because it's actually it can be somewhat controversial. And just to translate some of the language here, this joint scientific advice is talking to um, developers early on and. EMA says, hey, heads up as you're designing your trial, this is the type of information that we will need. And likewise, people evaluating the value of those medicines compared to previous treatments or th whatever the previous standard of care, they'll say, hey, this is what we need. It's meant to streamline the process. Do you, I mean, should these two processes of, of um, a appraisal, approval and, um, and HTA, a value assessment, um, should they ultimately be merged? Why? I think some people wonder why they're a separate process. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question. Um, I think you know I've been working in pharmaceutical regulation for over thirty years, and if you had asked me at the beginning of my career, I would have said keep you know economics has no place in medicines regulation. Um, but now the. Uh, when you see the reality and you see that actually uh, if the product isn't going to 
be reimbursed or uh, be integrated into healthcare systems, it, it really has no, no value. So we do have to do something to move these uh, mechanisms closer together. Um, and I think one of the challenges that the joint scientific advice was trying to address was the fact that the um, information for the reimbursement decision or the, the, the tr tr any additional trials that might be needed were asked for after the assessments, uh, the scientific assessment. So that was also delaying availability. So trying to understand if there are if there are issues that could be addressed earlier, that could be addressed at the same time during the scientific evaluation process is something that can really help uh, in terms of uh, uh, speeding up the process and delaying and ensuring that we don't have consecutive steps, that we actually have a more streamlined approach. Mm -hmm. And I and think it's about understanding as well. It's about mutual understanding. Do you envision taking any steps to kind of further um, increase the EMA's role or to discourage recommendations of approvals for drugs that may, may not bring much added value? Well, we have been, uh, we're very committed to the, um, the new regulation that has been uh, proposed, um, that's still not finalized at the moment, but that does give us uh, additional um, areas where we can, uh, in, we can collaborate. Um, and it gives us opportunities to um, ensure that there's a more streamlined uh, process across, across Europe. Uh, again, it's not us that, who are directly involved, but the interfaces are very, very important. Mm -hmm. And this is the HTA regulation you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I should have said that, yeah. No, that's okay. Um, and I'm wondering if your work, um, your previous position was head of the pre-qualification pre unit at the World Health Organization, and please correct me if I'm mischaracterizing, but basically that's sort of um, a way of recommending approval for medicines for countries that, um, you know, may not have a great regulatory structure themselves. And, and has, that, has that affected your, um, your approach to seeing um, accessibility as part of the, the regulatory role? Yes, I mean, certainly. Uh, in fact, I was, um, I was responsible for regulation and pre-qualification. So mm -hmm. in, in addition to the pre-qualification, which is an, effectively an assessment and inspection process aimed at um, uh, more low and middle income countries who may not have the resources to do them themselves or to support uh, tenders by uh, procurers um, to ensure that they're really that the the products that they're procuring really are of high quality. But part of this process as well it was also about strengthening regulatory systems. Part of my responsibilities was to ensure that uh, to set up systems for strengthening the regulatory systems in countries to have an objective uh, um, uh, way of ensuring that. Um, uh, countries receiving uh, products have the means to uh, be well informed and to evaluate these these uh, successfully. But it did really bring home to me uh, the importance of availability and access because you could see how very small steps that we might have made at WHO could actually make a difference in terms of access to uh, to patients, even though the regulatory step is not necessarily the end step, but the but in terms of access to safe, quality, and effective medicines, the 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 steps that WHO was doing really um, uh, increased the confidence uh, in the products that were going onto the markets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we have we have a lot of good questions from the audience. Um, so I'm just going to take a, a second to read one of them. Um, this is from, uh, and I apologize for any mispronunciations, Liddy Mayhoist. Um, and her question uh, is, in the proposal from the commission for the new mandate for the European Medicines Agency, um, uh, it says that should provide valuable advice on valuable clinical data raised by third parties, for example, dexamethasone for COVID. 
And will that be limited to emergencies? And why can that not be extended to life-threatening diseases like cancer? So um, in terms of the, the proposal for the mandate, for the, the increase in, in uh, the scope of EMA's mandate, um, obviously the, the full package uh, will have to go through the legislative uh, procedure. But at the moment, the focus really is on uh, emergency, um, uh, really fueled by the, the current crisis we're, we're in, some of the tasks that EMA has taken on in terms of managing shortages, in terms of accelerating uh, clinical trials approvals, in terms of um, uh, 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 looking at um, uh, uh, new products, uh, the focus has really been on the um, emergency side. Mm -hmm. um, I would, the question is, a, I think there are things we can do in, in the life-threatening side that actually we could, uh, we can look at our, our current mandate and we may already be able to do, but we, we needed a bit more agility on the dealing with um, emergency crisis situations. Mm -hmm. And can you just broadly react to um, to the proposal um, with the expanded mandate? Are those kind of, you know, the main things around shortages and a bit more role um, on evaluating medical devices? Are those appropriate um, additions to the EMA? And one thing that your predecessor would always, I used to joke with him that he never missed an opportunity to say that the EMA needs more staff. Um, so are you going to be um, following in his footsteps in that respect in, uh, in feeling that the EMA does not have enough people? Well, uh, first of all, let me say that um, the increase, the proposed increase in mandate of the European Medicines Agency is a recognition and acknowledgement of the success of its work. And uh, it's something that uh, if, if we are given this mandate, we need to be able to deliver on. So we need the resources to do that. Um, I am uh, confident uh, that um, there is a good recognition that uh, we do need additional resources. If you even look at what we're dealing with at the moment, the, the amount of products uh, that are coming through on COVID uh, uh, for COVID-related uh, uh, treatments or vaccines, it's, it's unprecedented in terms of the numbers that we would normally uh, look at. So yes, uh, and it's not just the initial application, it's going to be the post-authorization, it's going to be managing um, uh, uh, the product once they're on the market. So yes, of course, uh, we need to be adequate, we need to be appropriately resourced uh, for that. But um, I have to say, I am very optimistic uh, about this new mandate. I see it as a great opportunity. Um, I think the in the area of devices, while uh, this is not our core business at the moment. The, the, a lot of new products have uh, elements of device and uh, medicines. So again, it's something that we needed to be looking at from an, um, from an innovation perspective. So uh, I, I see these as, as, as very much uh, 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 tasks that we can, where we can add value. Mm -hmm. And I want to... Um... I want to ask a question about the transition process. I know that that Professor Razi had had hoped to just really have you two sitting side by side during the six months between when you were um, um, chosen and or five or six months between when you were chosen and when you are actually taking the post. But you obviously had a very important job at the WHO where you couldn't just kind of, you know, phone that in during your last five months. And that, of course, speaks to your qualifications. Um, but you know, just last week when we were preparing for this call, you were in Geneva. Have you been able to really immerse yourself fully in, in this new agency yet? I started in this agency on Monday. Uh, so to the extent that I'm on day three of my mandate, I've done uh, as much homework as I can. I, I have to say that I, I feel having been and come through the ranks within the agency uh, over 14 years previously that I've, I have a very good preparation. And then I guess the other aspect is the fact that uh, since March, I've been working 
in WHO, um, almost 80% of my time was spent on uh, COVID-related activities. So in that respect, I have uh, been able to prepare myself. But strictly speaking, I was a WHO employee until the 13th of November, and I started my mandate on Monday. So you're feeling very refreshed and rested, I'm sure. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, moved, I moved to Amsterdam on uh, uh, the 11th, um, and I did get a day off on Friday. <laughs> Have you already purchased a bike? Uh, would you believe it? I brought my own bike. I know it's a sin, but I brought my own bike because <laughs> I had a really lovely Orla Kylie bike that, that I, I couldn't leave behind. And um, I'm cycling to work. I'm cycling to work every day in the true Amsterdam spirit. Okay, so you're already fully assimilated. Congre that's a good start there, at least. Um, congratulations. <laughs> um, we have um, somebody in our audience was not uh, would like me to press you more on something, and so I'm going to use her um, her ammunition that he, she's giving me. So Anis Ranshin uh, Ranshan says, um, "How does the EMA plan on communicating about vaccines? Investment in communication was mentioned. However, I would love more precision. Twitter might not be enough." Um, well, all I can say is I couldn't agree more. Um, I think it's uh, the question of transparency and communication and how we really make our messages or make sure that our messages are understand, understood by the public is something that we have to spend uh, time investing in. We have a wonderful communications team here. They're looking at uh, uh, how best to um, ensure that we have the right methodology for communication in the context of COVID. I think it does mean we have to change our approach. We have to, to um, make sure that we are we reach the right uh, target target audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something that uh, is going to be a, a challenge, especially in the light of the infodemic and the misinformation that's out there. Mm -hmm. Do you expect to get more outside help with that or, or form new collaborations? I think uh, I honestly, I have to say that this is one of the areas where I still need to talk to. I haven't met um, all of the colleagues involved in this yet. So it's something that I I'm listening to you now and I'm saying, OK, yeah, let, let's let's see what we're doing and um, see what the plans are. I don't have everything at the top of my fingertips at the moment. Fair enough. Um, one, we're almost out of time. So one last question. Another thing that we have been following quite closely is um, Remdesivir, um, which uh, received a conditional marketing authorization from the EMA um, and then the WHO, the recovery trial actually shed some doubt on whether it's really that useful. Um, yet the US FDA has given it, a, I think, a full approval at this point. When should we expect um, an update from the EMA on remdesivir? So um, obviously, um, we are following closely the, um, uh, the output of the solidarity trial and any WHO guidance in this respect. What, would be, what is very important for us is to receive the data that motivated the, um, uh, the decisions from the WHO perspective. Um, we haven't received that data yet, mm. so uh, we we're not we have we're not in a position to to um, uh, analyze or see whether it would affect um, our conditional authorization at the moment. Mm -hmm. And are you satisfied with how forthcoming Gilead has been? So again, um, I this is something that I'm not in a position to comment on at the, at, at, at at the moment. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us just a few days into the job. Um, we're out of time. I don't usually ask people this um, in these types of settings, but are there any last points that, that you would like um, to make or messages that, that you want people to hear when they're just getting to know you? Uh, just to say that um, I think this is a very uh, challenging time for the whole regulatory community, um, but it's a very exciting time as well. Uh, we've got uh, really an opportunity to uh, show how regulators can um, 
can serve the community uh, to show the relevance of what we do um, and to make sure that we can we can uh, ensure that any products that come to the market are safe of high quality effective and that we are transparent and communicate appropriately about them so i i, I think we're committed to doing that and uh exciting times ahead thank you thank you and uh, seriously a huge step for transparency um, to, to set such a precedent of doing an interview like this so early. So a very sincere thank you um, from, from me as well. Um, so thank you, Amir. Thanks. That's, that is it for our health summit. Um, we saved the best for last. So thanks so much to all of our speakers over the past two days. Um, thanks to all of you for, for joining us. Um, I have last, uh, last announcements. Um, so yeah, the, I can see my next job is to give key takeaways from the entire two days. I think that we've seen that in some ways COVID has completely upended the entire health agenda, but in many other ways it has pushed things forward, um, whether it's the embrace of digital health, the recognition that um, environmental factors play a huge impact of our, on our health. Um, it's also made issues like medicine shortages they were already on the agenda even before the pandemic, but um, now they have been raised to the level of, of EU legislation and being added to the, to the EMA's agenda. Um, we've also seen our concern, uh, the concerns about vaccine hesitancy that existed before the pandemic now Come, become even more urgent. It's not just measles and kids, it's now whether we're gonna get past the coronavirus. And so I'm really glad we could have this interview to get a great perspective on the regulatory process and the process of, of regaining the trust of some people who, who don't have it um, in, in, for various reasons. Um, and we have also seen that there's still a lot of resistance from EU member countries to the idea of fully aligning on health. I think that was something that was clear from our interview with the Swedish health minister um, this afternoon. We also heard hints of it in, in other discussions. Um, and we've also heard about how um, uh, dealing with other health issues um, has been left a bit by the wayside by the pandemic, whether it's the delay in the cancer plan, the challenges facing health professionals, um, all those sorts of things. So um, that is my quick sum up of two days. Um, so thank you for, for bearing with us. Thanks for your attention. Thanks to our presenting partners, Roche and Lilly, to our supporting organizations, the European Feder Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations and the European European Patients Forum for making this, events possible, this event possible. Um, obviously, my Politico colleagues, both um, my fellow journalists on the health team and the events team, thanks so much to you. Um, last thing, we have quite a lot of virtual events coming up before the end of the year, including making digital work for SMEs in Europe, certainly relevant to some conversations we had today. That actually takes place tomorrow afternoon. So make sure to check out our future events on the politico.eu events uh, events page. Our next healthcare summit will take place again in November. Who knows where, but you'll certainly be able to watch it online. And um, yeah, as we cue the outro music, just know that uh, the events team and I are going to be doing kind of a, a robot dance. So if you've been sitting at your desk all day, I encourage you to do the same. Thanks so much. <laughs>